we will begin discussing the gastrointestinal system in the obvious place, the mouth, where food enters. So we have our oral opening, or mouth, here with the lips on either side, and then the oral cavity, not too obvious in this model, but we can see that we have teeth for chewing and grinding, we have the tongue for manipulating food and moving it down, and we have the separation between the oral cavity and the nasal cavity. This is the hard, bony palate here, but we also have a soft, muscular palate posterior to it, which helps us seal off the nasal cavity from the oral cavity so that we don't uh, accidentally laugh and have uh, milk fluid or other things kind of shoot out our nose when we laugh. And also, we have the food passing into the posterior region here called the oropharynx. Now, before we talk about the oropharynx, I want to note that just here we have our epiglottic cartilage. This helps seal off our airway from the way that the food is going to pass down posteriorly. And this is important to prevent choking or aspiration. And the space here between the tongue and the epiglottis is called the volecula. Now, that's a pretty fine point, but it's a major landmark when you're trying to intubate someone or make an airway. So just note that the volecula is just that space right there. From the oral pharynx, food will hopefully not go anteriorly into the larynx, but will go posteriorly. In this area, the laryngeal pharynx is the last place we have the respiratory and digestive tracts connected. And from there, we pass into the esophagus, which is posterior to the airway or trachea here. So the esophagus doesn't look like much, and in fact, it's usually flat when not having food in it, but it can expand tremendously as food passes down it. I want to note that there is a muscle, we don't see it here, but a muscle passing from the larynx to the esophagus, and that's called our upper esophageal sphincter. And it We're now going to move to this model and look at some of the details of what we just discussed in the upper GI in here. We can see a couple features that weren't as obvious before. We have some salivary glands, more on them in just a bit. But here we have, again, the mouth, lips right there allow food in, teeth for chewing, hard palate, separates the oral cavity from the nasal cavities above, and then the soft palate, a little more posteriorly, is going to allow sealing off of the nasopharynx from the oropharynx, and food is going to be uh, propelled posteriorly into the oropharynx and then pass down the esophagus and just posterior to the trachea and airway. So now that we have food in the esophagus, let's zoom in a little bit on the esophagus in the thorax. Now if you haven't already reviewed the heart and respiratory system, I recommend you do that. But for the GI tract, the major event happening in the thorax is food being moved down the esophagus posterior to the airway, which has been removed from the model right now, and the esophagus is going to take the food down inferiorly through the thoracic diaphragm, or respiratory diaphragm, or just diaphragm, to reach the organs of the abdomen. Note that it's traveling alongside the aorta here, so we have those two together. And one thing I want to note before we leave this area is how difficult it is to remove the esophagus from this section, but you can see on its outside we have some stripes impressed into this model, and that's actually accurate because the outer layer of the esophagus is actually made of uh, longitudinal muscle. If we were to look at it on this way, we would see that there are circular fibers going around the lumen more inwardly, but the outside is longitudinal, and the muscles laid out that way so that the food can be propelled inferiorly more efficiently. Now before we break down the contents of the abdomen and their role in the digestive system, I want to show you the organs kind of as they sit. And generally, we're going to have a division of the abdomen into quadrants. So going this way across the umbilicus, where the belly button would be, and then down the midline, we divide the abdomen into a superior right, superior left, inferior left and inferior right quadrant, and that kind of tells us which organs we can expect when someone describes pain in one of those quadrants. So once again, respiratory or diaphragm is just here. The liver is the large organ, largely located inside the upper right or superior right quadrant. We have the gallbladder just poking out, just underneath the liver there. So again, upper right quadrant makes us think liver and gallbladder. And then here, 
we have the stomach, so largely in the upper or superior left quadrant. We can't see it except for a little tiny purple strip here, but the spleen is located there and can also be a problem if we have pain in the upper left quadrant. Now here, the intestines are pretty interesting. We have the large intestine here, colored gray, passing down around, making basically a little bit of a uh, border here around the small intestine. Now the small intestine has three parts. We can only see two of the three here. Jejunum tends to be in the upper left, and the ileum tends to be in the lower right quadrant. If we have someone complaining of lower right quadrant pain, generally we're going to think that that is involved in the appendix, which we can't actually see here, but is on the posterior and inferior side of this part of the large intestine called the cecum. Lower left quadrant pain might involve the colon coming down and the sigmoid colon, which is again out of view, but we will see momentarily. So just be aware of which organs tend to be located in which quadrants. Before we proceed, this model is actually lying to us, and not in a malignant way, but in a way that's a little surprising. There is another organ that rarely gets mentioned in videos like this, and definitely on models like this. There is typically a sheet of tissue coming from the greater curvature of the stomach, wrapping down and around and then folding back on itself, and go passing along the superior border of the colon here. It forms an apron in front of the intestines, and this is called the greater omentum, and that just means apron. And I rarely see it mentioned in videos like this, yet when you open up a cadaveric donor and see the abdomen for the first time, it's not unusual to be expecting the intestines and to be faced by a sheet of yellowish fibrous tissue and have no idea what you're looking at. That, my friends, is the greater omentum. All right, we're going to break take three. To begin our investigation of the gastrointestinal tract, we're going to get some of these glands out of the way. Don't worry, we're going to talk about them later, but we have our liver and gallbladder here. And first, we're going to have our stomach here. We have the distal esophagus entering the stomach, and this is called the cardiac or cardia of the stomach. And then we have the fundus, little domed up area there, the body, and pyloric regions of the stomach. So we can see those on the surface. Note that the stomach has on its superior and somewhat right-facing side a lesser curvature, and on its left and inferior surface, this greater curvature. So those are major landmarks for the stomach. And now we're going to take a look at the internal structures of the stomach itself. So here we can see again the outer surface of the stomach and we're going to open it up so this model can let us see some of the internal features. Now there's a lower esophageal sphincter leading to the stomach but it's not a true sphincter, it's just a tightening as the esophagus passes through the diaphragm. And then here once again we have the cardia, first portion of the stomach, the fundus, the area with the dome, the body of the stomach is the majority of it here, and then we have our pyloric region. The pyloric region is this last part, but is different from the pyloric sphincter, which is a smooth muscle, and it is a true sphincter, surrounds this area, and only opens up when it allows the partially digested food to leave the stomach and move into the first part of the small intestine, called the duodenum. Internally, the stomach has multiple folds called rugae, and these rugae, basically, they can allow expansion of the stomach and allow a little bit of laxity in its wall, but they also provide a little more surface area so that the microscopic glands and cells in this area have a little more uh, to work with than just the balloon-like inner surface of the stomach if it didn't have these wrinkles. Returning to the next part of our gastrointestinal tract, we have our duodenum, the first part of our small intestine. So, Food leaving the stomach through the pyloric sphincter will enter the first part of the duodenum. To see the rest, we're going to remove the colon and small intestine there, that portion of the model. And here we can see that the duodenum is kind of a C-shaped twist of gut tube. We have a superior portion here, a descending second portion here, a transverse inferior portion here, and it's the third part, and then an ascending fourth part here before it turns into the second part of the small intestine called the jejunum. Let's look at a few of the details of this along with 
the glands that are associated with it here, especially the pancreas and the opening of the bile duct into the duodenum. So this is a view of the duodenum with a little more detail, but I'm actually going to substitute this one out for one that's slightly more detailed and gives us a little bit better view of these internal structures. So once again, we have the superior first part of the duodenum, the descending or second part, the transverse or third part, and the ascending or fourth part before we turn to the jejunum, the next part of the small intestine. I want you to note that here in the wall of the descending portion, there's some little bumps. There's a major duodenal papilla opening there, and often a minor duodenal papilla there. This is where we connect with the ductwork of the pancreas. And the pancreas allows us to digest proteins, also helps a bit with fat and carbohydrates, but it's a major source of proenzymes for digestion of the uh, proteins that are going to be present in our food. And then, one thing that you do want to note is that the gallbladder, which we'll talk about shortly, has its duct traveling into the second portion of the duodenum as well. And in fact, most commonly, the common bile duct or bile duct and major pancreatic duct both empty at the major duodenal papilla. So we have a single spot where bile for mobilizing fats and pancreatic proenzymes for digesting food are going to mix together in the slightly acidic environment of the duodenum to digest food. From there, food will move down to the rest of the small intestine. Before we go any further, I just want to note that this model should do a nice job of showing these semicircular folds or plique circulares inside the lumen of the intestine. Now these are present in all parts of the small intestine and there's just another way to increase the surface area but in this case it's not so much for expansion as it is for increasing the amount of surface area for digestion and absorption of nutrients into the bloodstream. And if that weren't enough, the cells on there stick outward, increasing the surface area, and on their surface they have multiple little villi or fingers pointing out in the lumen that increase the surface area that much more. So that's the job of the small intestine is absorption of food. It has other functions too, but that's the big one and that's the one I want you to remember. Continuing our investigation of the GI tract, here is the rest of the small intestine Note that right here, the duodenum is emptying into the first portion of the jejunum. And the jejunum is this section of the small intestine. Now, we're not going to be able to trace the entire thing like a maze all the way around, but jejunum tends to be present in this area, upper left quadrant. And as we move across, we transition into the ileum. There's no surface feature that we can look at that tells us exactly when we've left the jejunum and moved to the ileum. There are differences microscopically, as well as in the blood supply and the appearance of the arteries. But just for now, note that up here tends to be pretty certainly jejunum, and down here, lower right, tends to be pretty certainly ileum. The ileum is going to empty into the large intestine. And the first part of the large intestine it's going to empty into is this blind sac called the cecum. So the distal ileum travels through what's called the ileocecal valve, to enter the cecum, which is a blind sac. Now this ileocecal valve isn't a true sphincter. It does have muscle in the wall, and it does prevent just un, kind of controlled release of contents into the cecum, but it's not a true sphincter. Now from here, we have this blind pouch of the cecum with a little opening for the appendix. Now once we leave the cecum, we're going to be traveling through the rest of the large intestine. So let's zoom back out a little bit. And here we can see that food, which is now pretty much fecal material, is going to travel superiorly through the ascending colon to this side and then transition over to the transverse colon. Now this turn, where it does that, is near the liver, so it's called the hepatic flexure or the right colic flexure. The transverse colon is actually hanging out in the abdomen. It's held to the back wall by a mesentery or a sheet of tissue, but the ascending colon is typically stuck to the back body wall on the right. Transverse colon comes across to the left side, and here at the splenic flexure, also known as the left colic flexure, we're going to turn into the descending colon. Once again, stuck to the posterior body wall and travels inferiorly here on the left side from the superior abdominal quadrant on the left to the inferior quadrant, 
and at this point it's going to turn into what's called the sigmoid colon. And when that's obscured, so we'll remove the intestines from the model here, and you can see that the sigmoid colon gets its name for this S-shaped curve that it takes. So that is the sigmoid colon, and the sigmoid colon becomes the rectum, the final lowest portion of the gastrointestinal tract. Now, one thing to note before we take a look at it in detail is that the surface of the large intestine, or the colon, has some features on it that are somewhat important. We have these sacs called hostra. These are formed by the circular, smooth muscle inside, so they can kind of come and go as they help the food move along and become more or less prominent. There's a line of longitudinal smooth muscle, three of these on the surface of the colon. These are called tenia coli, and they're thickened bands of longitudinal muscle, once again, helping move the bolus of fecal material along. And there are often little fatty appendages hanging off the intestine. I'm used to seeing them in much more prominent uh, form than are shown in this model. But these are called appendices epiploeci, and the only reason they matter is that they can actually sometimes be a source of severe abdominal pain if they get twisted on their blood supply, even though functionally they are next to useless, at least as far as... We're now going to turn to the final part of the digestive tract, and the part most likely to get this video delayed as YouTube reviews it, the rectum. So here we can see our sigmoid colon moving down into the pelvis. We can see the bony pelvis here. The rectum is going to be where the fecal material is stored until we're ready to defecate. And here it's going to pass inferiorly into the perineum, or this lower part of our pelvis on the outside. It's going to be surrounded by an internal and external anal sphincter. And it's important to note that the internal anal sphincter is made of smooth muscle. It's going to relax when the rectum is full, but thankfully for us, socially, our external anal sphincter is made of skeletal muscle. And it stays tight until we are in a place and time we feel free to let it loose and defecate. So the anal sphincters here and the anal opening, just there, are going to be the final part of our digestive tract.